Jonathan Wheatland. So, so Jonathan, um, Dave was worried about keeping people from their comfort break. Yeah. <laughs> You're keeping people from their, from their wines. Yeah, I, I promise I won't talk for that long then. I'll keep it as short as possible. Uh, this one's just going to be lots of pretty pictures because I knew I was going to be the last uh, talk of the day. Uh, so nothing quantitative, um, just nice videos. Uh, so for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to be presenting a number of multimodal and multiscale data sets which were collected using a, uh, a novel imaging strategy known as uh, correlative tomography. Um, so within aquatic environments, fine suspended <coughs> sediments uh, tend to aggregate together to form uh, sediment flocks. And these uh, particles can consist of many thousands of individual primary clay minerals, silt grains, uh, decaying organic matter, um, and microorganisms. Um, this tendency to flocculate has uh, critical implications for the transport behavior of suspended sediments, uh, sediment-bound contaminants and pathogens, and also um, of interest uh, quite now, um, man-made uh, nanoparticles. Additionally, the structure of these uh, particles influences the stability of the bed forms they produce once settled. So understanding the mechanisms driving flocculation are critical for improving uh, sediment transport and, flocula and uh, sediment transport and flocculation models. Um, but what's difficult is, because they're so fragile and multiscale multi in nature, um, uh, it makes investigating them uh, very difficult. Um, so a uh, flock can range from the, so the flock properties range from the nanometer scale with the individual particles that make it up, all the way up to the whole flock structure itself that the particles uh, um, aggregate to form at the, at the millimeter scale. Um, so previously what people have, to investigate the properties of flocks, what people have tended to do is use a technique at, known as correlative microscopy, which allows you to uh, characterize flocks at the nanometer scale, so looking at individual clays and bacteria, and at the millimeter scale using uh, 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 light microscopy. Um, at the nanometer scale, we, we tend to use uh, transmission electron microscopy. Um, these have been really useful uh, and have given us a great deal of information of how, how these uh, materials uh, flocculate and form. However, as you can see, there's a critical spatial gap that exists which prevents us from understanding how uh, nanometer phenomena relate to the gross scale or millimeter scale flock structure. Additionally, the techniques are two-dimensional in nature and we can't extract 3D geometries from 2D images. Uh, so this data is fairly useless um, as a means of um, input data for uh, transport models. So there's this critical spatial and dimensional gap. Potential solutions to this problem is the use of uh, correlative um, tomography, which combines multiple uh, 3D imaging techniques to investigate uh, a single sample. So basically like a Russian doll effect, uh, you collect data sets at, at, uh, at multiple length scales uh, and get a full, a full image, a full image of its structure for one sample. Um, so this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to see whether we could adapt uh, this technique, which is commonly used in cell biology and material science, and see whether we could investigate these, fract uh, these um, really uh, fragile entities. Um, so briefly, uh, we wanted to first uh, see whether we could actually stabilize these fragile structures for analysis. We can collect as many data as we like, but if, if we manage to basically destroy our samples, these data sets would be pretty pointless. After that, we wanted to develop a correlative workflow, which would allow us to uh, um, collect these nest, nested data sets. And, and then we wanted to, based on the data that we collected, uh, create a conceptual model that explains how these materials are uh, aggregating together and also the role of microorganisms. So I'm not going to go into much detail about the methods because of time, uh, but this is basically what you get at the end. This is just a, a graphical image uh, um, of what the sample looks like once it's been stabilized. A critical point, though, was obviously making sure that we didn't destroy our organics. Um, we developed a, a technique which allowed us to fix our organics and render them vacuum stable. Uh, so first provide, um, putting the, first fixing the samples, then staining, staining them, and then uh, finally embedding them in a resin.
So moving on to the data set, at the nanometer scale, our nanometer scale data set allows us to understand the composition of our flocks. Um, this is fairly well, so in flock research, this, this uh, 2D uh, STEM, data set, uh, STEM data sets are quite uh, common, and so it doesn't really offer much else. However, what it did allow us to do was to investigate the intracellular integrity of our um, microorganisms. And we did this to uh, basically ascertain whether we had, whether we'd, we had successfully stabilized our flocks for analysis. Um, what we found, I won't go into great detail, but what we found was basically, um, it, was, it was fine. <laughs> Yeah, so um, you, would expect, you would expect to see uh, living, dead, and uh, more bond um, bacteria within a, within a natural population. And we found that the, uh, ver the um, proportion of living, dead, and more bond uh, were very similar to what you'd expect. So we didn't see a large number of empty cells or um, damaged cells, which would indicate that we had basically obliterated our sample. Um, so moving on to the, uh, the micrometer data sets, um, we use a technique, no, a, a fairly new technique known as focused ion beam nanotomography. Basically what, it, what it, this does is it uses a normal SEM and you have your uh, electron beam and your ion beam and you cut and you take sequential images uh, and that allows you to create a 3D volume and create lots of nice pretty pictures. Uh, so quickly passing through this, so uh, this is a volume that is about 15 uh, microns cubed, so you can see uh, it contains de de decaying organic matter, um, you can see the individual bacteria within it, and clay, uh, um, and clay minerals. Um, you're, you're, we're at the resolution where we can see bacteria splitting and begin to understand how these structures associate with, with clay grains. And what we see is the bacteria form these little nuclei and, and attract clay <coughs> minerals around them uh, as a means of um, uh, nutrient assimilation. Um, we also can begin to identify different morphotypes within our um, within our samples, which is, which is complete, something completely new, moving from 2D to 3D. So this is a larger um, FibNT volume. Um, it's around 67, micro, uh, 67 microns cubed, and what you'll see now is uh, the uh, false-colored clay mineral has been stripped away, and we're left with individual silk grains, cyanobacteria, and you can see these purple dots, they're individual bacteria. Um, what we see is uh, um, the clay mineral is organized into discrete, discrete primary particle, uh, discrete um, primary associations. And then these are <laughs> bound into larger structures known as microflocks. Um, and so as this passes through, so you can see a cyanobacteria there. Um, so this one here, this is what we identified as a, uh, as a microflock. So the resolution on, on this volume is around uh, 50 or so uh, nanometers. So we're, getting, so, we're, so we're at a resolution where we can see uh, individual bacteria and um, resolve them in, in quite high resolution. Our, um, so now moving up to the... Um, the millimeter scale. This allows us to identify. Uh, this allows us to characterize the whole flock structure. And as you can see, um, previously, what people have tended to do is just characterize, uh, just um, uh, represent them as spherical, um, uh, as, as as spheres, um, simple two D, uh, simple um, uh, geometric simplifications. Um, but you can see here, this is the, the the complex structure. You can see density variations within our flock. Um, and what we see is this, this complex, twisted structure. And what we think is that this is a sediment flock that has been um, eroded, like a, 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 a biofilm map that has been ripped up. And we can see this. If we move to a, a, a higher resolution scan, which we took with micro CT, we can see individual um, uh, cyanobacteria um, twisted and contorted into this, fat, uh, into this almost uh, thatchwork structure. And this is this area here. 
And the uh, cyanobacteria, what we, what, what we think is happening, acts as a backbone, a, 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 a structure, um, a backbone structure for the whole flock, allowing uh, the small um, microflocks to uh, aggregate together to form these larger structures. So quickly, briefly going through the model, what we think is that, uh, what, what we can see is that actually um, the uh, mechanisms governing, governing flocculation, which I haven't gone into much detail about, vary according to the LEM scales. The LEM scale that you're looking at, at the, na at the nanometer scale, electrochemical forces are uh, dominant. Um, moving up from that, you have uh, bridging mechanisms, or EPS, which, co uh, which allows uh, microflocks to form and uh, for, uh, and then after that, our backbone mechanism comes into play, where you have cyanobacteria, which allow these larger structures to form. Without the cyanobacteria, it's unlikely that you'd be able to get these large macro flocks, which are millimeter, uh, which are millimeter um, in size. Um, so I'm going to leave that there because it's now time for wine. I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Time for for one question after applause. <laughs> One quick question, anywhere? Yeah, go ahead. We're on uh, wastewater treatment systems where there's, there's flocks in that sort of environment. Mm -hmm. Do these methods also work in that sort of system? Yeah, I don't see, I don't see why not. I mean, this came from the Thames, so God knows what's in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it should be fine. Yeah, go ahead, one last one. So um, we basically let them settle out in, into a plankton chamber, and then we extract as much water as possible, leaving a, t leaving a small film of water that it would be retained in. We then added agarose as a stabilizer, and then we could, uh, we could then subsample and pass it through our stabilization procedure. Thanks very cool. much.